Say thank you to Tammy. Come on for sharing. So good. I was, uh, I was so excited just what she shared because of obviously what God's doing in their life, but also I was excited because next Saturday we're doing another prayer service. So right, just the timing of God doing it and prompting her to share because God wants you to have stories just like that. And, uh, and those stories we miss out if, if we don't step in. And uh, that's why the book of James talks about when you draw near to God, he draws near to you. Sometimes he takes the first step, but sometimes he asks us to take a step. And so uh, for the first, uh, first Saturdays over the summer, so the first Saturday in July and also the first Saturday in August, uh, the message is going to be a 15-minute just encouragement to inspire faith in your heart. Uh, one of our elders, Steve Ruggiero, is going to be doing that next week. Uh, and then we're going to have, just like we did at the uh, beginning of June, we're going to have nine prayer teams just ready to minister to you during the worship set. And I'm just telling you, if you have never had someone pray over you, then you come. You, you might not even know why you're supposed, I'm just, just come and say, I don't even know why I'm coming except for Fred told me that I should. And so just come and just give God an opportunity to show up in your situation, in your circumstance. You can also come and pray for other people. You, maybe you feel like I, you, I'm just in this place where everything's going great. I bet you know somebody who can't say that. Then you come and you stand in their place. So thank you, Tammy, for sharing that. And I'm not going to wear your glasses and uh, I'm going to wear mine. This is great. Should I try them on? What do you think? Now I'm going to stretch them out because my head is really big. That would not be good. That would not be good. So, so good. So good. Well, I'm excited for the series that we're in, Eden. April, I'm going to jump around a little bit tonight. I'm going to start with body, soul, and spirit. Let's, let's jump in there. Somebody say body, soul, and spirit. I, I want to point out, you know, we upload these notes every week or on our website that go along with the podcast that give all the scriptural references and the notes that we follow for people that are interested in doing some follow-up study. And uh, I just want to point out that back on April 13th, Sharon Thomas again, Sharon's getting a lot of nods tonight, uh, shared as part of our Break the Yoke series. So when you go down uh, onto our, our sermon part for the Newport News campus, you'll see Break the Yoke series. And, uh, and it'll say guest speaker, and that's the one for Sharon. And in those notes, she gave us a chart that night, and I'm uploading them into my notes again tonight uh, to make it really easy for people to find. But in that message, she, she talked about these three parts of who we are, body, soul, and spirit. Now, I'm not going to reteach that chart, but I just, I just want to give you a little, bit, a little bit of an overview. And, and, and the idea is that, is that my body is important because it gives me form and function. When God created mankind in the Garden of Eden, right, this series is, is looking back into Eden and, and the lessons that we're, that we're finding. Last week was Born to Suffer, and I'll share you this next title in just a minute. But that, that what we see is that God gave Adam and Eve biological bodies. They didn't have heavenly bodies, even though it was a perfect place, and in some ways it's giving us a glimpse of the heaven that's to come. He still created them as biological entities because they lived in a temporal world. So these bodies are necessary for us because they give us form and they give us function. Now, for many of us, like myself, our form is not necessarily what it used to be, and it doesn't function all the time the way that it should, but we make the best with what we've got. You with me? And so, so we need form and function in order to operate and engage in this natural world. But he also gave us a soul. And the soul gives me identity and eternity because your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. So it makes you who you are. It's what makes you special. It's what makes you unique. It, what makes, it makes you different than any other person in this world. It's interesting, right, that your fingerprint is unlike any other person's. And in some way, I think that's a prophetic insight into the nature of the soul. There's no one else like you. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, they're, they're unique. It's your identity. And then also, that's the part of you that is eternal. It's the part of you and I that's going to live forever. It's the part of you and I that heaven is longing for and waiting for. So we have this body that gives us form and function. We have this soul that gives us identity and eternity. But then he also created mankind different than anything else that he created, is that he created us with a spirit. And it is our spirit that makes it possible for us to have a relationship with our creator. It is, it is our spirit that makes it possible for us to commune with God. I want, and so do you, this body to one day give out. We do. 
Because God, God did not create us to be here. He created us to be there with him. I want this body to one day give out so my soul's relationship with God can be restored because my spirit has been renewed through Jesus. Let me read it again. I want this body one day to give out so my soul's relationship with God can be restored because my spirit has been renewed through Jesus. So it was the tree of life in the garden that I believe that enabled Adam and Eve's biological bodies to not decay or die. Now, can I just have, one, can I just have a little bit of a complaint about the creation story? Hopefully I'm not going to get struck by lightning here, right? Whatever happened to that pastor? Well, it, is that, why couldn't it have been the deli of life? Are you tracking with me? Right? I mean, it's a tree and it had fruit. And fruit's okay. Fruit's okay. But how about the deli of life? Right? How about the Frenchie from Jimmy John's? Anybody with me with that? Have you had that sandwich yet? There's no condiments on that except for butter. Praise the Lord. That belonged in the Garden of Eden. I'm just saying. Now, you might say, all the theological people here, Fred, it couldn't be the deli of life because then that would have required the killing of animals for there to be meat to eat and there was no death. And what I would say to you is this. If Jesus could turn water to wine, God could have made bacon out of air. Right? He could have made bacon out of air. It, it, it's, this, it's this idea that, that, that God was put something in the Garden of Eden. He's God, so he got to pick. So he made it a tree, and it produced fruit. And the Bible tells us that when it was time for Adam and Eve to be evicted because of the sin that they committed, that God said that they need to go so they would not continue to eat from the deli of life. Come on. Genesis 2, 8 through 9. I'll meet you at Jimmy John's after the service. Then the Lord God planted the garden. Listen to this, Genesis 2, 8 through 9. Then the Lord God planted the garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man that he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we, last week, if you weren't here last week, you listened to the podcast, we talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and what that meant and what that uh, happened to Adam and Eve when they ate of it and how we understand what that means for us in the here and now. But I believe that the tree reminds us that you and I were born to die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil tells us, as we explored last week, that we're born to suffer. But the tree of life reminds us that we are born to die. That we were not created for this world. We were created for the world that's longing for our arrival. Listen to Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Then God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. Again, we taught on that last week. What if they reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. I think God's saying, hey, they can't stay here because if they continue to eat from the tree of the fruit of life, these biological bodies that I've given to them will continue to live on. And we don't want them to live on because we need them to be set free. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And after sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now this series is important because it's debunking, I think, how a lot of us have grown up. We've grown up being taught that the Garden of Eden was God's perfect plan, and then mankind messed it up, and then God had to start over. But if that's what we believe, it makes no room in our belief system for the sovereignty of God. It, it, it approaches it as if it took him by surprise. But our belief, and what we got into last week, is that God's plan all along, which is why he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to begin with, is that he knew mankind was going to fall. In fact, he intended them to fall, because that's part of what gives us the gift of a comparative experience. So one day when we get to heaven, it'll be the only thing that we want, because we've experienced life without God. But the only way we can get there is to leave here. So he gave us a body that wouldn't survive. 
so the eternal part of who we are could one day receive Christ, and then when we breathe our last here, we can step into eternity there and be with him forever. As I've been studying this story, I found it terribly curious as to when God refers to Adam by name for the first time. You see, when we read these stories in the Bible, because we know the end of the story, we sometimes assign information to the beginning of the story that's not there yet. And when we do that, we displace what's called chronological context. Because when something happens in the Bible is important to us. And maybe you've never noticed it, but God does not refer to Adam by name as a proper noun until Genesis 3, 17. Now, depending on what translation you're using, it might not get it right. The New American Standard is one of the most literal translations in the Bible. We often use the New Living Translation here because it's easy to understand, but in our study and our research, we're always looking in multiple different translations. So let me give you Genesis 3, 17. This is interesting. It says, Then he said to Adam, it is the very first time in the creation story that he uses his name. He says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you until you will eat of it all the days of your life. Now, there's this research book called Strong's Concordance, and it gives a number to every Hebrew word in the Old Testament and a number to every Greek word in the New Testament. And in the creation story, there is number 120 and there is number 121. Because Adam's proper name is the same exact word for mankind. But the reason why Strong's Concordance gives it two numbers, because in the Hebrew, in 317, something changes in the context of the language. Before 317, every time that God refers to Adam, which in the Hebrew is Adam, which means mankind, male and female, it's only ever used in the general sense. But when you get to 317, there is a new number because now in the Hebrew, God takes this word for mankind and he makes it a proper noun and he gives Adam an actual name. And he's not done that yet before in the garden, in the creation story. We read it as Adam because we know his name because we know the end. You track it with me? But it's not until now does he give him an identity that is his own. There's a reason for this. Because when God made Adam in the beginning from the dust of the earth, he does not give him the name Adam. He gives him the name mankind because he wants mankind to understand that we're not supposed to have an identity that is apart from him. He wants us to understand that even though one day he knows he's going to give us a name, the identity that we draw from ourself is always supposed to be secondary from the identity that we find in our relationship with our Creator. And even as Pastor David was up here tonight talking about this need for us to walk in expectancy, I had such a sense that some of you here, you've lost your capacity to be expectant because you've lost your identity in your relationship with your Father and with your Creator. There is something about a restoration to an identity that only comes first and foremost from being a child of God. When Adam ate from that fruit, just like his wife, he still had a body, he still had a soul, but now he was spiritually dead. Mankind's ability to commune with God was lost, and the identity that comes from it was displaced. And so God gives him a name as a marker for an identity that's missing its most important component. Kim Tree Slaughter, they were away on vacation when she preached recently, right? What an amazing message she shared, just challenging us about mental illness and how the church, and we believe it, has got to get to a place where we don't just tell people to get better, but there's practical steps that we can take through help and counseling and, yes, sometimes even medication. But she talked about, which I had never seen before, that in the creation story, 
God always spoke to the source of something before he created life. So when he created fish, he spoke to the sea. When he created the fruits and the trees, he spoke to the earth. And then she said, but when he created man, he spoke to himself. So good, isn't it? Because our source is always supposed to be in him. And when our source is in him, our identity comes from him, even though now we still have a name. Now watch what happens. Genesis 2, 21 to 23, right? We're backing up in time here. So the Lord God calls, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Right? This happens to us often, even today. Some of you even now. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And then the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man and the man said hello hey you're cute listen to what he says this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh watch the text the text is so instructive she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man he does not call her eve he does not give her a name because he doesn't have a name because their identity is only in their father. He does not give her a name because he calls her just as God has called him. He is mankind and now she is woman because both of them together realize that there is no life apart from God. He, he's, when he gives her this, this identity of woman he's teaching her she's just come to life adam's been around for a long time now right we don't know if these are literal days or not I mean, most theologians believe and i agree that they were in the garden for for some time before they committed sin and then if you really dive into the story which we're going to do throughout this series you realize that adam god gave him a job to name all the animals before he even created him so how long did that take yeah I, i'm guessing a long time so he's been in the garden by himself. Now there's a lot of reasons why that, and we're going to get into the series, but I think one of them is because God was trying to establish in him this idea that Adam, there's no life apart from me. Mankind, there's no life apart from me. I your identity has got to be in me. So when he brings Eve to Adam, right, who doesn't have a name yet, it's just mankind, right, he says, you are woman. What is he saying? He's not just identifying her gender. He's not just right, continuing in the job of naming the creatures. He's, he's saying to her, hey, I've been at this for some time now. And I want you to know, just like I've learned, that together we have no identity apart from him. That he is our source and that he is our life. And now together, we're going to live with him. Right? When we begin to dig around in this story, we see the egregiousness of the violation that we introduced to ourselves last week with the temptation. What Adam and Eve were willing to lay down. So when they said we can't eat of that fruit from that tree because will die lucifer right this fallen angel comes in and says no 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 you will not die you will become like him which was his way of saying you can be your own source you can have your own identity you can choose your own way you can be your own person how many of you here tonight are walking in the consequences of making those same choices I know for me, I didn't make a vow of devotion to Christ until I was 23. I'm 52 now, and one of my greatest regrets in life is that I didn't do it sooner. And the reason why I didn't do it sooner is because I was buying into the same deception that many of you are buying into, and I bought into it for almost my entire life, that I wanted to be my own person, not realizing that I can't actually ever become the person that God created me to be. I'll never experience the fullness of life until I find my identity with my Creator Genesis 
There's a reason why the names weren't given until after they had committed a sin, because the names that God gave them was part of his acknowledgement that you've now chosen a path and an identity apart from me. So now in Genesis 3.17, we see that God's given Adam his name. And in Genesis 3.20, the man turns to his wife, who's only up until this time has been known as woman. And it says, now the man calls his wife's name Eve. And the text tells us because she was the mother of all the living things that would come. But that sword cuts two ways. It's both an honor, because she would be the source of life, and it was both a tragedy, because she would now be the source of life. She would be the source of natural life, but God did not create us just to be natural beings. As you read throughout the story of creation, there is a phrase that God repeats over and over that something could only produce after its own kind. So after Adam and Eve fell, after they were spiritually dead, and the world began to be populated, they could only give birth to people just like them. People who had a body with a form and function, that had a soul, that gave them identity and eternity, but they were spiritually dead for generation after generation after generation after generation until Jesus comes and dies for the sins of the world and made a way and made it possible for us to be reborn and renewed for relationship with God to be restored so that our soul could once again find our identity with him. And he does not make these bodies immortal in that moment, and we do not want him to because we want these bodies to one day give out now that our spirits have been renewed so that we can step into eternity and have a relationship with God that lasts forever. Let me share this thought with you. Because we were all born to die, so our souls, the part of us that gives us our identity and our eternity, could be free to join God in the Eden that awaits us. A restoration of our identity in Him forever. If you're here tonight and you've never made a vow of devotion to Christ, then I hope that you make it here tonight. We're going to be going into a worship song in just a minute to wrap up our service, and I'm going to be standing right down here. Pastor David's right over there. We'd love to pray with you tonight. You might have come in here with form and function and identity and eternity, but you came in here without a relationship with your Creator, and you can leave made new. You can leave here tonight with a sense of expectancy and a sense of hope that one day when you breathe your last, that heaven's going to be waiting for you. That the children's story of Eden, that you grow up and somebody telling you about in a vacation Bible school or on a flannel board if you're old enough like me, or in a storybook, or maybe if you're of a newer generation through Veggie Tales themselves, the sacred ministry of the cartoon. That Jesus has made a way for you and for me. Can we just agree we don't want to go back to the Eden that was? Because that was not God's plan from the beginning. It is the Eden that he calls us to, where we all want to make our home. Genesis 3.21. This text is so rich. This entire, all three of these chapters. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. It is the first time in the creation story where we find that there is natural death. We know there's spiritual death when they ate of the fruit. But when God took a life of an animal to take the skin to give them clothing as a prophetic picture to cover the nakedness of what they now were on the inside because of their loss of identity from him and their relationship with their creator, he took this life because he was telling the world a story And that story is that one day 
I will take the life of my own son. And just as I'm covering Adam and Eve on the outside, one day when he lays down his life, he's going to make it possible for the sin of us on the inside to be covered. The nakedness of who we are because of the choices that we've made, the rebellion that we walk in, the hurt that we cause, justice cries out to be served. And so Jesus steps in to be the sacrifice for you and for me so that he can close us on the inside so that when we in our imperfect nature of who we are and the brokenness of who we are, we can step back into a relationship with God because of the holiness of Christ in us. He makes a way for my identity and for your identity to step away from who we've been and who we are and to become again a child of God. Stand with me. Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts tonight. We thank you, Father, for just the whisper of your spirit in our ear. We thank you, Father, for the stillness and the sacredness of these moments that we find ourselves in together. And I pray that as we step into this moment of worship together tonight, as, as we just give our life just a pause, we know that because of our identities that lead to life roles, that create demands, that there's a lot waiting for us on the other side of those doors. But may it be that just in this moment, that you, in the way that only you can, just Help us to set all of that aside. Help us to find ourselves in a place where it feels like we're the only person that's in this room. And it's just you and I in a conversation. Believing tonight that, God, that there are some things that you want to say to every person that's here. For some, we know it's to encourage them in their season of suffering like you've been doing for David and Tammy. For others, we know, God, that it's because they're supposed to find a renewed sense of being expectant and hopeful as Pastor David was sharing with us earlier. But I believe also that for some people here, it's because they've been living their entire life with an identity that is apart from you and that it's time for them to be covered for them to be made new, for you to breathe on them like you breathed on Adam, for you to breathe on them like you breathed on the disciples in the upper room, for you to breathe on them like you breathed on some of us in our own journey, in our own story, that there is a spiritual birth that's waiting for everyone in this room. It's interesting, God, to think that maybe it's not us that's just being expectant tonight, but maybe you stepped into this moment expectant for us. Expectant for us because you see the life that you want to give birth to in the people that are here in this room right now. Because you see the emptiness that is there. You see the void that is present. You see the absence that you want to fill. And we say, let it be tonight. Let it be tonight that we would receive from you every good and perfect gift that you would bestow upon us. In Christ's name, come on, let's worship together. Oh.